Hello, my name is Kelly Tebow and I'm with the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders. And I will be your organizer for this evening and would like to welcome you to our webinar on youth suicide, start the conversation. Thank you all for joining us. Before I have my colleague introduce the speakers for this evening, <clears throat> I'm gonna go over some housekeeping items with you. All participants are muted. If you have a question, please type it in the bottom of your question box and click send. Um, Ms. Brogan and Ms. Sesick will answer questions at the end of their presentation and we'll get, we will get to as many queries as time allows. In addition to tonight, it's uh, presenter is available to take, take your questions on our Wednesday webinar blog that is found on our website, www.njcts under the heading programs. This blog will be monitored for the next seven days. If you missed part of the presentation or would like to just listen to it again, an archive version will be posted to our website. We value your input and in order to expand the webinar experience, there will be a exit survey when you leave the webinar. NJCTS, its directors and employees assume no responsibility or accuracy for completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any member or physician, nor do we advocate for any treatment. Now, I'm going to turn over the introductions of our speaker to Barbara Chabner, the program manager of NJCTS. Barbara. Thanks, Kelly, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Barbara Chabner, and I will be working with Kelly tonight to bring you this NJCTS monthly Wednesday webinar program. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us here tonight for Youth Suicide Start the Conversation with Wendy Sefcik and Maureen Brogan. This topic is not only timely, bringing to a close Suicide Prevention Month, but it is a sobering topic that touches most of us in our lifetime. Maureen Brogan and Wendy Sefcik are here to help us ask the right questions, give us guidance, and share important resources. Ms. Sefcik serves as chair for the New Jersey Youth Suicide Prevention Advisory Council, as a New Jersey chapter board member for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, as a member of the Morris County Stigma-Free Task Force, and is employed as the Suicide Prevention Coordinator for Bergen County. Wendy lost her 16-year-old son, TJ, to suicide in 2010. Ms. Brogan is a licensed uh, professional counselor with over 20 years experience working with individuals, families, and groups around issues such as trauma, grief, bereavement, loss, and abuse. Trauma and crisis response is her specialty. Suicide prevention is another area of expertise. Maureen Brogan is a member of the New Jersey Youth Suicide Advisory Council and contributed to the New Jersey State Plan on the Prevention of Youth Suicide. It is my great pleasure now to hand off the presentation to Maureen and Wendy. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, we're going to start with the next slide because Wendy and I, and that was a wonderful introduction, I appreciate it, um, but we want to start off by saying, other than what we do and how we are in the world, we're real people that have um, a passion for this work, um, but we identify very differently sometimes in how our resumes read. And I guess that's how we want to start the day of being like, we just want to keep it real. We know that all of you have various roles, whether for me, it's wife, mother, besides being like a suicide awareness master trainer and a trauma expert. And I think that's what it, we want you to keep in the back of your mind today as we go through the next hour, that we all come in with our own stories. We all have our own narrative. We all have probably been touched by suicide in some shape or form. Um, so we want this to be like a non-judgmental learning experience, but really the most important part is like, hopefully you will see Wendy and I as just real people who are very passionate about this work, but it's the work that we do, but we're like real people and we'll go through stats in a little bit and those stats are real people so that's why we start with this slide and then wendy's going to share next a little bit about you know who she is in the world next yes i as maureen said in addition you know to to the work that i'm doing 
Number one, I was brought to this work because I lost my 16-year-old son, TJ, to suicide. Um, prior to that, really, suicide was not on my radar. And after losing TJ, I really you know, felt compelled to figure out what had happened. And I have to tell you, I now look at myself as a community member because I believe that we all have a role in suicide prevention. And I know that as community members, whatever walk of life that you enter this webinar with, whatever your knowledge is, I hope that you're gonna leave knowing that as a member of a community, we all have a role to play in suicide prevention and you can really have an impact. If you advance the slide, please. Suicide can be a very sensitive topic to discuss, but talking about suicide is critical to its prevention. And we are so grateful to each and every one of you for joining us to start this important conversation. We're gonna start with a very, very short video, which hopefully is really gonna get you thinking when it comes to kids. If you could roll the video, please. like we're having technical difficulties. Hopefully, Kelly and Barb, you're aware of that. Okay, I didn't realize it wasn't playing. I'm hearing it just fine on my end. My apologies. Um, we may have to skip the video and just provide the link for another time. That's okay. Uh, Maureen, Maureen will pick up and she'll she'll let you know because now I'm sure that you have that burning question. What was that video about? It was only 44 seconds and Maureen will, will give you a little bit of an idea of what it was that we were trying to illustrate. If you can move to the next slide. So we usually, um, we share that slide and you'll have the link to the video because what it is, it's young people in their own words, like sharing things um, that in the real world really don't happen. Like, so the video is showing like kids sharing that they're depressed, asking for help, saying they might be um, part of the LBGTQ community. And then the last kind of slide is said no team ever. So really what it is, is it's what we like them to share with us, but it, the video points out that, yeah, these are not really forthcoming conversations. We have to draw it out of our kids. So we like sharing that video from the, the Mayo Clinic. Um, and we'll send you that link as well. So for today though, what we really hope to accomplish is um, hopefully you'll have some increased awareness about youth suicide in general, being able to recognize some of the warning signs, some of the risk factors. Also too, Wendy and I will explain as well. Um, sometimes warning signs mean things and sometimes they don't. And that's why it's so important to have a conversation. Also too, risk factors, not one size fits all. So we really want to get to the part today where how do we start this really important, but yet sometimes very difficult conversation. So I also, at the start of any program when it comes to suicide prevention, always say to the audience, like, not only thank you for being here, but thank you for being so courageous because not many people um, put themselves out there. And I think we could save many more lives if we are willing and you know, confident that we can put ourselves out there. So that's also will fall into how do we as individuals, whether it's a mom, a teacher, um, you know, friend, neighbor, what roles do we play in suicide prevention? And, and also importantly, leaving you with resources because never do we want you to feel alone, just like we never want our young people to ever feel alone. Um, New Jersey is really, um, I think, fortunate in a way that we have a lot of resources and sometimes we're not always good at sharing those resources. So tonight we want that to be a little bit too about sharing those resources. Next. When we're having conversations about suicide, it's really important to model appropriate language. 
so that we don't perpetuate the stigma of suicide or other mental health conditions. We want to avoid using phrase, the phrase committed suicide as it can have a really negative connotation. Instead, we encourage the phrase died by suicide, ended his or her life, or killed himself or herself. When talking about suicide and suicide attempts, we want to avoid referring to attempts as completed or failed, successful. Not only is it unnecessary, these words imply judgment. Instead, we encourage the use of phrases such as suicide attempt, suicide, and death by suicide. When suicide is talked about safely and accurately, we can help reduce the likelihood of its occurrence. We want to change how society understands mental health and suicide because we, when we open up and have important conversations, we can all save lives. Maureen's going to talk to you a little bit about statistics. If you advance the slide, please. And again, as we mentioned earlier, when we're talking about statistics, we're also talking about lives. And I think sometimes um, being in the field of suicidology, the numbers um, become so important, but yet they're never as important as like taking that individual and what role that individual had. And that was like a loved person. Um, suicide is the second leading cause of death nationally and in New Jersey for our young people. So ages 10 to 14 um, in 2018, 605 deaths. And then 15 to 24, 6,211, which then capture our later high school and our college age students, and then our aging out into the real world or into the workforce. Um, in New Jersey, we happen to be either the 49th or the 50th lowest state, lowest rate. And again, you think about it, well, that's all well and good, you know, but you, we can't stop there and just be satisfied that, you know, oh, New Jersey, well, we're in a state that has the lowest rate because this is really impacting our classrooms, it's impacting our families, it's impacting our community. So we did wanna just say too that this is really representing like every hour and 17 minutes, there's a young person that has taken their own life. And I think, you know, think about that again in people in the time that we're together today, we've lost another young person. So we're gonna move on to some additional um, statistics to give you an idea of this, the scope. So also too, um, we have people that are dying by suicide, but also too, um, looking at people also attempt suicide. So these are just some um, data points. I don't wanna get all caught up in it, but every day approximately 3,000 youth in our high schools attempt suicide. So that means they've had the ideations and they actually went as far as making a plan. So in the field too, we're looking at it going, how do we have these conversations that we can intervene between the time that they're thinking of it and the time that they actually make a plan. So again, it's just reiterating again, the second leading cause of, cause of death. So we're also just gonna, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but it's the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And now we have recent 2019 data. This is a survey that goes out to various schools throughout the country. And what's really great about this survey is that it's self-report. This is not like adults saying, oh, I think this is what the kids were thinking, or this is what I heard them say. This is their own self-report anonymous. And this is what they are saying. This is what our middle school, our kids in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are telling us. 22% of them reported that they seriously considered suicide, seriously thought that in middle school that life was not worth living anymore and that they were in so much pain that maybe that was an option. 17% reported that they made a plan about how that, what they would do. And then 11% of our middle school students have actually self-reported that they've made an attempt. What's important about this data too is with the self-report is Sometimes we think we have all the answers because like, well, shouldn't we be able to tell attempts by hospital data or um, emergency room visits? But this is not the same as self-report because many times an attempt doesn't necessarily bring you to the emergency room. 
So this is a self-report. So we actually view this as more accurate, like from the mouths of babes to be like, this is really what they're saying. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm feeling. No judgment. Now with our high school students, what they're saying is 31 and a half percent had said that they felt sad or hopeless. 17.2%, they've said they've seriously considered suicide. And 13.6 have made a plan on like how they could end their lives. And then also too with our high school students, 7.4% are saying they've attempted and 2.4 of students who have attempted have resulted being treated by a doctor or nurse. So sometimes you'll hear that 2.4% is what we think is the accurate number, but really it's 7.4%. So when you think of those numbers and you think of a high school or you think of a classroom, it's, I don't want anyone to think like everyone's thinking of it, but we need to pay attention to it because it's there. And I know at the Dramatic Loss um, Coalition, a lot of times we have our little elephants that we have the kids toss around because we say, why aren't we talking about the elephant in the room? When they have an opportunity to self-report, they're reporting it, but somehow we're sending the message, like don't talk about it unless it is anonymous. So we have to do a little better job of saying like, it's okay and we need to have these open conversations, not just conversations where you self-report when no one's gonna, when no one's gonna know it's you. So we have some work to do still um, in the nation and the state as well. So we'll move on to the next slide. It's really important when we're talking about teens, right, that we address the idea of social media. So a lot of times people want to instantly say social media is awful. This is the reason for all the problems with kids. And unfortunately, social media is here to stay. So we really have to look at both sides of it. And there really are pros and cons to social media, just like there are to most things in life. So let's start with the positive. We know that social media does provide support for marginalized populations. It does create, it, it eliminates geographic barriers for kids. And there, there also is a lot of awareness raising and educational opportunities via social media. A lot of people who have struggled, um, we have a, a lot of even people out there um, that the kids really relate to that share their stories, talk about it, and share how they can get help and what they can do. Those are really positives. It also provides an opportunity to partner with suicide prevention programs, and it is a way for kids to stay connected. Um, sometimes we wish they would connect in other ways, but we do have to look at it does allow for connectivity. And then, of course, we do have to look at some of the negatives. There can be this opportunity to create these virtual friendships, and, and we know that that is not the same as real life relationships and being able to sit in a room with somebody and have a conversation. So that's something we, we want to consider and we want to talk to our kids about, that there is a difference. Also, with the idea of bullying, it can be relentless cyber bullying. Kids cannot get away. Homes are no longer the safe place. Back in the day, you came home from school. If you had the bully at school, you can come home, you were safe. But kids' homes are no longer necessarily the safe place from bullying. They can be bullied relentlessly on social media. So we have to pay attention to that and have conversations about that. The risk of media contagion, unfortunately, often suicides are covered in a sensationalized manner, which can put those struggling at even greater risk. So it's important that we're aware of what our kids are seeing and hearing on social media. And then unfortunately, there's this ability to search online for information about suicide, which would include looking for ways, looking for methods. And, and we just heard a few weeks ago, there was actually somebody that recorded his own um, suicide attempt. So these are the types of things we need to be aware are happening. We need to make sure that we're talking to our kids and have an awareness of what they may be seeing on social media. So we need to talk about it. Always remember that one of the greatest myths of suicide is talking about it will plant the seed. Our kids know about suicide. We need to talk to them about it. Moving on to the next slide. I just want to have another word about bullying and suicide because we do hear about that very, very often that um, somebody may have been bullied to death. Um, they, they killed themselves because of bullying. And it is absolutely true that there is a relationship between bullying and suicide. The bullies 
are also at a higher risk. Research shows that those bullied and those doing the bullying are actually at a, a very high risk. Bullying is a problem that absolutely has to be dealt with, but it's not thought, it's thought that bullying alone without other intersecting factors will not um, create suicide. We know, unfortunately, that many, many kids are bullied, and fortunately, many of those kids do not take their lives. We have to remember that hurt people hurt, so we have to take care of everyone and deal with the underlying risk of bullying, but don't make suicide so simple to think that it can come down to one thing. If you just uh, advance to the next slide, please. We want to remember that suicide is a very complex health issue. Just like there are warning signs and risk factors for other health crises like cardiac arrest, we can learn the warning signs and risk factors that can help us to stop people from dying by suicide. Prevention can start early, far in advance of the problem, or prevention can occur closer to the time of crisis. So let's start by looking at some of the risk factors. Maureen? So when we talk about risk, risk factors too, and at the very beginning, I was alluding to that um, just because someone there's a risk factor. Again, suicide's not a cause and effect. Um, so we're gonna look at some things that put someone at possible higher risk. Um, and also too, um, a friend of mine once told me, oh, it was you, Wendy, who had said, you know, people have risk factors like for heart disease or diabetes, and yet the risk factors, they never quite reach the point where they become diabetic or they have heart disease. It just means that they were at higher risk. So when we're talking about risk factors, these are characteristics or conditions that increase like the chance a person may take their life. But again, going back to that, everything is so individualized, which I think is another reason that suicide is just so complex and researchers have been trying for decades and decades to figure out like, what is it, you know, looking for that, what can we do differently? And I think it's because it's so complex and so layered and so individualized that, um, risk factors are kind of like, okay, so we're going to go over a few like health, historical, and environmental, just to give you an idea of, hey, maybe I should pay attention to this a little more. So we're going to start off with some like, um, with the three different categories on the next slide. So when we talk about like the health risk factors, there are some biological and psychological medical conditions. Um, usually you hear mental health, that can increase the risk of suicide. What's really interesting is there was a time when we would say in the field, 90% of people who die by suicide have a mental health condition. We're starting to move a little weight away from that, especially that strong 90%. If someone has a mental health condition, yes, do we want, are they at higher risk? Possibly. But we're also seeing, um, I sit on the Child Fatality Review Board for the state of New Jersey, we're reviewing cases of young people who have taken their own lives, and we're saying it doesn't appear that there was a mental health condition. So I say that um, to say that it's a risk factor, but it's sometimes there have been deaths by suicide where there was no mental health condition. So again, it's just something that we do want to put on our radar to be like, hey, possibility, a higher risk. Also do if someone has a serious chronic health condition. Um, a lot of research will also say that's because, too, of just being in the physical pain can also just um, transfer over to, like, emotional and psychic pain. Um, in the field of suicidology, too, we say people don't really want to die. It's not a death wish as much as it is to get out of the pain that they're in. Um, they, people who take their own lives are in severe emotional, psychological pain. Um, and that's the other reason, too, we're looking at chronic health conditions if you're physically leaving, living in pain. Again, there's people who live with pain their entire lives who will never even have a suicidal ideation. It's just something we want to put on our, on our radar with chronic pain and health conditions. And also, too, a lot of research now is being done on serious head injuries. So those are other things, too. So if you're hearing about people that have had either accidents or concussions, just something that we want to say, hey, this, this may be someone that we just want to put on our radar for a little bit. And we'll talk a little bit more too about, it's the almost like the perfect storm 
of risk factors with warning signs and triggers. So um, again, nothing is easy about this whole night's conversation. So um, more, more to come with the other risk factors. So what if you look at some, if there's a family history, these are historical risk factors. Um, the debate too is, is there something genetic about it? Or is it also too, if there's a family history of suicide, is it the exposure? Because in the field, we're saying like exposure to a suicide makes someone at higher risk. So there's a lot of research going on. Is it because of like almost that nature versus nurture? Like what's going on for that person? Um, was there abuse and neglect, a history of trauma? Um, and also we really pay attention to our young people that if they've made an attempt, they fall in a higher risk of attempting again. So we want to, and sometimes you'll hear of it as well, watching our young people, actually anybody who's been discharged from a hospital setting because um, they are at higher risk if they were hospitalized because of an attempt. And especially that magical, and they still stick with this two week period afterwards um, to really carefully monitor someone who's been hospitalized in that two week period in that transition. And you'll hear that other word too, again, transitions. That's another um, risk factor, not historical. Um, and also to um, sexual orientation. But it's the environment. And I always like to stress this, that it's not because of anyone's sexual orientation that puts them at risk. It's are they in an environment that's not respectful or accepting of that? That's what becomes the risk factor. Because if someone's in a um, situation where they're being embraced for who they are and they're supported, it doesn't necessarily fall on the risk factor anymore because it, there's not that rejection, there's that acceptance, there's that support. Then we also wanna look at some of the environmental factors that, that could lead to higher risk. These are things are like, what's going on in the world around us? Um, one of the most important ones is access to lethal means. Some people will actually say that New Jersey has a lower rate, if not the lowest rate in the country because of our strict gun laws. Um, so some people are saying it's harder to get like your hands on a weapon and that's one of the most lethal means. So that's um, a risk factor. If someone can get their hands on something where they can actually take their life. Um, so we always tell people that are in law enforcement, you know, if, you're, if your child's struggling, to really make sure that gun is locked up. If you're a hunter, please make sure that that's um, you know, properly put away because of the, the lethality of it. Another environmental factor, which we had mentioned briefly too, was like the exposure and, and the contagion factor. Contagion is really a phenomenon that happens with adolescents, not so much with adults in the adult world, but it's when there has been a death by suicide one of the reasons the TLC um, is called in to help schools is that there's a concern that other youth who are um, vulnerable, who have been exposed to this, it puts them at higher risk because of this exposure. It's the same thing with the family members as well. We're also looking at is, is there a prolonged stress? Is there toxic stress? Or is there a stressful life event that's happening right at this particular time? Um, and also too, I would just caution you to be like, stressful life event, it's what the person thinks is a really stressful life event. Sometimes as adults, we're a little too quick to try to either fix it or minimize it to be like, what's the big deal? It was a breakup, you know what I mean? Or okay, it's bullying, that kid's just mean, they're a jerk. And we sometimes um, don't mean to because we just don't wanna see any of our kids in pain. So sometimes we'll minimize some of their stressful life events. So we just wanna make sure we're having conversations to see how do they view it? Because if, it's, if they view it as really stressful, then we have to take it seriously that it is stressful. Um, and also two transitions, transitions of all types. Human beings are creatures of habit. We like predictability. We like, they know that it goes A, B, C, D. There's something to be said about like knowing what's next. So transitions can be a difficult time for a lot of people, including ourselves. Think about like, you know, when you get married, which is very joyful for the most part, I hope. I hope those of you that are married are still joyful, but it's a transition. There's still an anxiety about it, but like what ifs? 
but transitions for our young people in particular, we're really paying attention to like transitions that are um, to either moving, changing schools. Um, we, are, we were especially um, with the TLC looking at, hey, what about our elementary kids that are you know, now transitioning to middle school, middle school to high school, high school out to the workforce or to college. We know that transitions are really difficult. That was also, too, one of the things that we were concerned about with this pandemic. The predictability factor kind of went out the window, and our transitions don't resemble our transitions. And our transitions that some had ceremonies attached to them didn't happen this last year, which made transitioning even more difficult for some people because they didn't feel like they had that closure. Transitions could also mean sometimes to um, transitions if if people are actually um, our young people are going through um, their uh, transition in their sexual, you know what I mean? Like whether it's their identity or actually um, going through transitioning that you hear with, the, um, with our transgender youth. So sometimes you hear that transitioning part as well. So those are um, a summary of some of the risk factors of just kind of putting people into um, different groups. And I don't mean to just like pinhole everybody, but then Wendy's going to explain a little bit more about the importance of, if we know the risk factors, what are the signs? So Wendy, thanks. So the difference between, there's a difference between risk factors and warning signs. We need to look for both. Risk factors that Maureen just covered tend to endure over time, maybe uh, across somebody's entire life. Warning signs are observable signs that signal that suicidal risk may be imminent. So it's really important to pay attention to both. Um, if you see warning signs, you want to make sure that you reach out to the person that you're concerned about immediately. You don't want to wait. You do want to reach out. Suicide warning signs are typically displayed in three main ways that we can observe. Talk, behavior, and mood. So the next slide is going to tell us about what we can observe on talk as a warning sign. Many people who are suicidal talk about ending their lives maybe subtly, maybe directly, maybe indirectly. A person might say it outright, they may joke about it, but you need to take it seriously every time, especially kids. They really may just kind of throw it off as a joke, but you wanna take it seriously, have a conversation. Some people might say things like, oh, you know, what's the point? You know, I, I, there's, there's no reason to live or, you know what, I'm just no good. I, you know, I'm just a burden. Um, you would all be better off without me. They may talk about feeling overwhelmed or and Maureen talked about the idea of this unbearable pain. So if they talk about being in unbearable pain or, or complain about pain often, you want to pay attention to them. Any things like um, being trapped, a lot of these are things, especially in light of what we're all dealing with with the COVID pandemic, you know, this isolation being, you know, having to stay home. You want to hear what people are saying and maybe react, not panic but just have conversations. The next um, warning sign that we want to look into is behavior. What behaviors can we look at? Suicide can display certain behaviors um, that, and what you really want to look for are behaviors that are not characteristic for the individual. So that's why it's hard. We can go over a long, a long list and I will, but what you want to do is you really want to pay attention. Is that typical for the individual? Some of the things you want to be on the lookout for is an increased use of alcohol or drug use, um, trouble sleeping or sleeping too much. This is something you might not be aware of with kids, but if you see, you know, your child, you know, having a hard time getting up in the morning and they used to pop right out of bed, um, you know, falling asleep in school, those are the types of things that tell you maybe they're not sleeping right. What's going on? Eating. Are they eating too much or not eating enough? Again, it's, it's a change in their typical behavior, withdrawing from activities, especially activities previously enjoyed. A kid who you couldn't get off of the sports field and suddenly says, you know, I don't know if I want to play anymore. Kid who's really active in theater, you know what, I, I'm not going to go out for the play this year. That's a reason to have a conversation. And you really want to look at if they're isolating themselves from family and friends. We know that many, many of our teens really love to live with their friends. They want to be with their friends all the time. If if they're suddenly pulling away from their friends, maybe you want to have a conversation. You also want to be on the lookout. You can see this if you do, you know, you, you see something that they may have been looking for. Maybe they're searching 
online for ways to kill themselves, um, looking for, you know, how, how can I buy a gun? How can I do this? You want to observe that and you want to react to it. And also giving away possessions. You know, I, I don't need this anymore. Maybe giving something to a sibling or a friend that was a prized possession. You really want to be aware of those. And as I said, with these warning signs, it's not about observing them and waiting. It's about observing them and starting the conversation sooner rather than later. Next slide, please. The next thing that we want to look at as a warning sign is mood. And a lot of these are things that you would expect, right? You would see maybe depression, apathy, rage, irritability, impulsivity, humiliation, and anxiety. I want to, you know, go back to that um, anger. A lot of times when we think of suicide and we think of depression, we think of sadness. But a lot of times, particularly with our youth, we might see irritability. And that might be a sign that is missed because you see a kid that's just angry and irritable all the time. And you're not thinking he's, he's, he's not acting sad. He's mad. Well, that could be a sign that something's going on. We all have ups and downs in our mood. But if there's a change in mood that's going on for days and weeks at a time, it's a sure sign something might be going on. Somebody may be in pain internally and we need to have a conversation. Maureen's gonna talk to you a little bit more so that you can try to bring down all these risk factors and warning signs and really understand what can we do. So, risk factors, so we know we're, there's certain groups or certain things that we're looking for, then warning signs, actually things that we can observe to say, but then we also want you to think that there are some critical cues, um, things that, okay, we can't look the other way now. And this is what um, Wendy started talking about too, is that when people are talking about or making plans for suicide, um, that's a critical cue. And Wendy had mentioned that um, research has shown that most people share, that even share their plan. So that's like when it comes like, okay, this is critical. Also too, I do want to caution everyone um, as well as I'm a clinician by um, education and what I've done for years is that I worked with a lot of schools at times where they would say, ah, oh, they talk about it all the time. You know, like it almost became like a minimizing of like, of course, She's saying she's going to kill herself. But Wendy had said that every time we hear it, it's like we still have to take it so seriously. I also ask people to think about it. If it's attention seeking, which I've heard people say like, oh, it's only attention seeking. There's some reason that they're going that far. And obviously they're in need of some kind of attention. So again, like a critical cue that we need to like address this, have more conversations, try to get the youth to share a little bit more with us. Also, too, if they're expressing hopelessness about the future, if they just are feeling like things are never going to get better, like what's the use? That's more of like the language, you know, no matter what I do, it always comes out this way or I don't get ahead. Um, if they're actually displaying some of their um, emotional pain or distress, the good thing about the display is that we can see it. What we've also found from the Child Fatality Review Board is that we have some kids that are really good at faking it. They're like faking it until they make it and they're in a lot of pain and they've become great at still putting that smile on their face, um, almost like an imposter. So we may see the display of the severe and overwhelming pain, but also too, if you feel like, hey, this has been a really rough time for them and they may be in a lot of pain, that's another time when we have to have the conversation. Because like I said, we have a lot of youth that are not demonstrating and showing it, whether it's in their face or, or the way they're behaving and they're still going to school and they still might be getting A's and they're still laughing and they're still the life of the party. But if you have reason to believe that they still underlying might be in some emotional distress, we want to say, tell me more or ask or point it out. Um, Wendy had also said too, if you hear that they're saying like, they're a burden. Like when you hear like my family would be better off without me, my teammates would be better off without me, the world would be better off without me. Um, really something that we want to hone in on sooner rather than later. Um, Wendy also had said too about the eating and sleeping habits. Um, and again, we've talked about it all the time. It's 
knowing the, your child's baseline is like, what's normal? What was their way of being in the world? Because I don't really like the word normal, but what was like their routine? What was their way of being in the world? And are we seeing drastic changes from that way of being in the world? Um, also to extreme anger. Um, you know, I said too, I'm like, really, is that anger is a powerful emotion? Um, I'm sure all of us have gotten angry at times, but the good thing about anger is one, it's a sign that we usually don't ignore as much as um, sometimes the isolation or the withdrawal because you can't ignore it always. Um, but if it's extreme, we want to try to figure out like what's underlying that, what's going on for that person at that time. I think the hardest part too is about not being judgmental about it. Um, I had someone say to me once like, you know, it's really a good sign if your kid can be angry at home, and I'm like, I don't know, it doesn't feel so good having an angry kid at home, but that means that they feel comfortable and supported there, that it's okay to show that. So if you're seeing that at home, or if you're in a school system, or if you see it in your Boy Scouts or your team or something like that, it might actually be a sign that this kid is really struggling, but this is the place where they feel safe to, to let that anger out. So, um, although we don't necessarily like being surrounded by anger, really view it as, I think this may be a cry for help. Um, and also too, like we had said, looking at those uncharacteristic behavior changes. So if we can forward. What we had said too, is that we went over a whole bunch of things um, you're probably like, yeah, that's a lot to remember. And you, you don't need like a, maybe you want a little cheat sheet of like, what should I be looking for? What were the warning signs that they said? But in the field, what we've found is that it's really helpful if we just think like, is path warm? And if you look at this um, slide too, it's talking about like, is there ideation? Is there substance abuse? You know, do they express that there's no purpose? Do they seem anxious or trapped or hopeless? Do you see that there's a withdrawal, some anger or, or risk taking behaviors, which I don't think we addressed before, but we definitely want to pay attention to if there's recklessness or risky behavior, like throwing caution to the wind um, and mood changes. So in the field, we've actually said too, when we're talking with a young person to be like, is path warm? And just looking at some of these help us to be like, hey, maybe there is something more going on. So we kind of named this presentation about starting conversation. So how do you start a conversation about suicide with your teen um, or a teen that's in your life or in your community? You know, some of these things are, they're just going to make, it's just common sense. You, you want to find a nice, private, quiet place to talk. This probably isn't a conversation that you want to start if you're in the middle of your kitchen and you have the phone ringing and the dog barking and you know other kids running in and out, you wanna find a, a quiet, comfortable place that you can have a peaceful conversation. And you wanna make sure that you have time, time to really listen in case this is the time that this teen wants to open up and start this conversation. You wanna really be able to listen. There's a great saying, right? We were given two ears and one mouth. Um, it's become really one of my favorite phrases because it really makes a lot of sense. We need to all do a better job of listening and hearing and not, um, not listening to respond, but listening for listening's sake. We as adults very often wanna fix things for our kids. So as they're starting to tell us something, we're already formulating a plan to fix it but I really encourage you to simply listen to what the teen is saying, what they're trying to communicate to you without trying to come up with advice or, or something to fix it. You wanna be able to express concern and caring. Maureen mentioned it before about kind of dismissing it. Oh, everyone goes through that. We wanna just express concern and caring and try to use the phrase, tell me more, get them to keep talking. You wanna be able to ask them directly about suicide. Don't be afraid to say, are you thinking of suicide? Are you thinking of killing yourself? And that's something that I think as parents, even clinicians, you need to practice in front of the mirror before you practice in front of a real life kid or a friend or a family member. You wanna be able to say that in a non-judgmental manner. There's a big difference between saying, 
Are you thinking of killing yourself? And you're not thinking of killing yourself, are you? Because the second question, asking it that way, is telling them how you want them to respond. So you really want to make sure you have the conversation in the right way. And then, of course, you want to be able to encourage them if they are exhibiting any of these risk factors and warning signs and have now in the conversation led you to believe that they are thinking about suicide, you want to encourage them to seek mental health treatment and to be evaluated by a professional. This isn't something that we have to handle alone. And we have a lot of great clinicians out there who are trained to deal with this. So you want to guide that team to mental health clinician. If in crisis you think something's going to happen right away, don't be afraid to call 911 or go directly to an emergency room. If you advance the slide, please. I just want to go into a little bit more detail about how this conversation might get going. Um, as I said before, you want to avoid minimizing feelings and you want to use concrete observations. So you don't, when your kid comes home from school, you're, you just, you know, saw this, um, this webinar with Maureen and I. So you just, kid walks in and you say, look, are you thinking of killing yourself? No, you want to, you want to be able to say, you know, I, lately I've noticed that you're staying in your room a lot. You haven't been seeing your friends. Are you unhappy? Is something bothering you? So you want to try to open up the conversation, right? So you're not telling them you haven't been going out with your friends, you haven't, you're saying, I've observed, this is something I've seen and I'm concerned. Maybe you wanna say, you seem really tired lately and I noticed, you know, I made your favorite dinner, you haven't, you didn't even touch it. You don't seem to be eating, you know, lately. Is something going on? Are you unhappy? Do you wanna talk about it? Can you tell me what is going on? And then you can even, you want to take it that step further. And you want to say, sometimes when people are feeling like you, they wish they were dead or they think about killing themselves. Do you feel that way? How are you thinking of killing yourself? And then if they do respond that they have, you do want to take that conversation further. You want to know, have they thought about how they would kill themselves? Do they have a plan? Do they know when they would do it? And if they keep giving you information about this. That's a sure sign that you need to take that child for a professional evaluation right away. If they have answered yes, that they are thinking of killing themselves. Yes, they have thought how they would do it. Yes, they have a plan. Yes, they know when they would do it. That's not the time to say, I'm so glad we had, the, we had this good talk. I'll see you in the morning. That's the time to connect your child to a, a clinician immediately to get help right away. But that is how the conversation can go. And you need to be prepared for the conversation to go just that way. So don't go into this thinking, oh, I'll have that conversation. They're not gonna, they're, I, know, I know my kid, my kid's not thinking that way. You want, if they do respond that yes, they have had these thoughts, you wanna be able to hear what they're saying in a calm manner because you don't want them to shut down. And if you freak out, they're going to shut down. So you want to keep keep them talking. You want them to reach out. You want to be that trusted adult for your child or to a child in your community. If you're a clinician, if you're a teacher, if you're just somebody in the community, a gatekeeper is what we like to call all of us. We're gatekeepers in the community. Be a trusted adult for a child. Listen to what they have to say without judgment. And don't try to fix, try to help, try to lead them to resources, of which we have many, and Maureen's gonna share some of the great resources that we have access to. And part of the um, resource part is sometimes we don't know they exist, and other times um, we are either ashamed that we need help, and really we're doing a disservice to our young people by not modeling that help-seeking behavior is actually a strength, um, and it should never be viewed as a weakness. So I also, as you being the trusted adults, um, also too are constantly modeling that. So sometimes it's like we have to model for them that we ask for help, um, that sometimes things can seem a little overwhelming for us and that we're okay with asking for help. It's setting the tone for them to be like, hey, everybody needs somebody at some point. We can't always go it alone. So, um, so the next couple of slides are different resources that we really have um, encouraged people to explore more, spend time with. So on the next slide, um, well, actually we'll go to the next one as well. Um, we will also, um, Kelly mentioned that she can get these out to you as well. 
because um, I know you don't have to sit there and jot them down real quick right now, but um, the Suicide Prevention Helpline, which you saw on the slide before, and these um, helplines, 24 seven. And the crisis text line, because we know a lot of our young people, oh, not even our young people, a lot of people now like would prefer to text rather than actually speaking to someone. It's just an easier way to communicate for a lot of people. So here, um, and in New Jersey, like you can text either help to 741741, or in New Jersey, you can also type NJ to 741741. Um, and the crisis text line too, will connect them with other people who, um, maybe in this area that can then connect that person to additional resources if they felt that they needed to through the conversation and also to here in the state of new jersey the second floor youth helpline which again um again help line people call second floor or texting as well to second floor um for everything from like i need help with my math homework to my boyfriend just broke up with me to i have a major math test tomorrow to um i'm thinking about ending my life so they're trained to do everything and therefore in between, whether it's conflict, bullying, um, or just something to do with everyday life, or even to like, oh, it's my girlfriend's birthday and I don't know what to get her. So it's this line where there's a trusted adult on the other end that can help just listen sometimes and then also to maybe offer some, um, not necessarily advice, but that just helping them come up with what would work for them. The other part that we always, um, I always encourage when we do responses, I ask our young people, I said sometimes to them, like you, Mimi, take out your phones right now, and you don't have to put all three of these, but put one of them in with your contacts. And you may never need it, but a friend might. So think about it as, hey, if you never need it, nothing, no judgment, you don't need it, but what if a friend could use that? Or um, the other thing about these helplines is someone's there answering at three in the morning. Um, you could have a trusted adult and they might be sleeping or they might be your school counselor or your coach and you may not be able to reach them at two or three or four in the morning someone's going to answer the crisis text line or the suicide helpline um, at those hours as well i also um, wanted to share too about the importance of these helplines is i had one class do it and one gentleman um, a young a young kid in one of the classes said huh i guess I guess there must be a lot of people that need help at times because he's like, I don't think they would create all of these like hotlines and helplines if people didn't need help at times. So part of it was that it was validating to be like, yes, we all need help. And he was absolutely correct. If people didn't need to talk to people at two or three in the morning, if people didn't need that little extra text or someone staying with them while they were going through a hard time, we wouldn't need these lines. So that's another story for me too, that I said, yeah, these are powerful. So we're gonna go through a couple of more so we can get to some questions and answers. Um, this also to preventing suicide, it's a toolkit for high schools. This is through SAMHSA, so this is the federal um, government. The, a lot of our uh, schools here in New Jersey have these on their bookshelf and it's part of like um, prevention, intervention, and then um, some post-prevention guidance. So we're just sharing that as a resource. And I really encourage you, because um, Kelly's gonna send it to you and at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, is taking some time and just, you know, Google it. Look it up, the website, the web pages are there. See what they have to offer because there's so much. We're giving you a snapshot. These are now are like resources that have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of additional resources and pages of things written and guides that you could use. So um, when you have a little more time, I really encourage you if you're interested in this topic, um, and for all different populations, different ages. So um, when you're looking for something, you're gonna find it either um, in SAMHSA or this um, Suicide Prevention Resource Center. So we're gonna um, move on to a few more resources still. I told you there were a lot here, <laughs> New Jersey and nationally. Um, I hope that this is not a new concept to you. I hope if you have children in the schools, you have heard of SCL social emotional learning which is really and this is to the castle website who were like considered like the experts the gurus in the field who have been doing this for decades before sel was popular they were doing it it's really talking about how do we before we get to the academic side of school how do we help our kids socially and emotionally learn the skills that they need to thrive not only survive because 
that needs to be addressed before the academic part does. Um, someone once said, too, it's like, we need to talk about um, a hierarchy. Like, we need, our kids need to feel safe. Our kids need to feel validated before the learning can happen. Um, we heard a lot of this over the summer, especially with the pandemic and the return to school. Like, people were just being honest to be like, every child is coming in here with their own story, their own narrative. We need to address what has this pandemic done for them emotionally and socially, this disconnectedness, you know, during a pandemic, before we get to the math and the reading. Not saying that that's not important. It is important, but this needed to come first. I, I'm happy to say that I a lot of New Jersey schools did take that, and I'm still hearing that they're still in the social emotional learning part, um, although there is pressure for the academic side. So if you haven't heard of it, I would do, you know also to um, see what your schools are doing. And this is one of the um, pages too that the Traumatic Loss Coalition usually hands out when we do responses or when we have people inquire to us about, hey, what resources are out there? Um, and again, we'll send this to you because all of these resources, again, have all these subcategories and other resources that they can connect you to. So whether it's about trauma, whether it's um, the Center for Disease, um, CDC, the World Health Organization, as well as our local one, like the, um, the Hope Line and Society for Prevention of Teen Suicide. So um, you'll get this, but I really, again, encourage you to like, hey, Google, Google it, hit their website, see what they have to offer. Reach out to them if you have questions. Um, we know how difficult this conversation is, so we're thrilled at the Traumatic Loss Coalition when someone reaches out to us asking for more information, because we're just so psyched that someone's like, okay, they're willing to go there. So those were just some more resources that we wanted to share with you um, to also validate that you're not alone either. So um, now we're going to go to some, any questions or comments, and I know Kelly has been monitoring, I guess, the Q&A. Thank you very much, um, Maureen and Wendy. Oh, thank you Barbara, very, very sorry. much. Yeah, so that's okay, no problem. Uh, thank you very, very much to both of you for that excellent, uh, informative, and very helpful presentation. Um, we have a few minutes that we can take some questions. Um, so type them in if, uh, if you have a question. Uh, and I'll start with one here. Um, you talked about uh, starting a conversation, um, and um, we all know that uh, adolescents, in particular kids, it's difficult to talk with, talk to. So, um, what if I try to have a conversation with my child um, and they won't talk? What can I do? I think one of the best things we can do is is to be available and to be willing to stop whatever we're doing when they want to talk, is they don't always want to talk when it's convenient. Um, my 23-year-old came home today and I was preparing for this presentation tonight and I was getting dinner ready and I was working on um, like three other things and he walked in the door and you know what, he, he wanted to talk and it was not a convenient time for me. Um, but guess what, I put the phone down, I shut the computer down, and he really just wanted to tell me about his day. Something happened that he wanted to tell me about and something happened with his girlfriend that he wanted to tell me about. And I listened. I took those few minutes. They don't always want to talk when we want to. So I think the best advice I can give you um, on that is to just be available and be cognizant that a lot of times we're really busy. It's not that we don't love and that we don't care, but our minds in a million different places. And when it comes to our teens and when they want to have the conversations, we need to be willing to have them. And if you ha you know, try to open a conversation and it it's just not the right time, that doesn't mean it's one and done. You know, try again at a different time when maybe they're more open to that conversation. And one day I'd also add too is that sometimes um, as adults we need to get over ourselves too and maybe even throw it out there is like i'm concerned about you or i noticed this and i'm here but if you don't want to talk to me is there someone else is there another trusted adult in your world that you do feel comfortable talking with because it doesn't have to be me as your mom as your coach as your teacher as your therapist so um i think part of it as well is 
is saying like, is there someone else when we talk about trusted adults, I always encourage people to have a conversation with their with young people in their lives to be like, who are, who are five? Well, you can start off with two, but who are like ultimately five trusted adults in your life that you would feel comfortable that you're, those are your to go-to people. Um, so having that conversation as well, because sometimes it's not gonna be us that they wanna speak with, but having that in advance, I think is helpful. But that was a good question. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I want to just make a, uh, a note of a comment that someone made. Um, she says, I just wanted to mention that a perceived improvement in mood and or circumstances does not necessarily mean that a person is doing better. Um, would you like to comment on that? That's, that's a fantastic, um, you know, and really, you, you know, shame on Maureen mm -hmm. and I, we definitely should have mentioned that. I think I had that in my notes. You're absolutely right, because somebody that's in pain um, and has been dealing with this for a long time and maybe been having these thoughts, uh, and all of a sudden they make a plan and they decide, you know what, this it's all going to be over because I'm going to do something mm -hmm. about it. They may all of a sudden perk up and seem to feel better and maybe seem a little bit happier and a little bit more lighthearted. So it's what we said many times in this presentation, it's noticing changes in behavior. So if somebody has been really in what you would imagine is a very depressed state and very you know, isolating and all of a sudden their mood just seems to change and, and it's completely different, that's still a time to have a conversation. So thank you very much for, for bringing that up. That's, that's important to know. Okay, uh, along similar lines, someone noted uh, sometimes a mood improvement gives them the energy and ability to finally follow through and end their life. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, glad someone brought that up is that's also too part of that, um, which contributes to that two weeks that we had mentioned, like after a hospital stay, is that sometimes after, um, whether they were hospitalized and now they're back home or they're transitioning back, they're actually feeling better. Um, Research has shown like truly, truly very depressed people that are not moving, that are not getting out of bed, may not be able to kill themselves because they can't even physically get themselves to do it. So then when people start to feel like, hey, I'm starting to feel a little better, we want to monitor that because now they might actually have the capacity to, the clarity to make a plan and the energy to carry it out. So again, if someone had been on our radar, um, and again, we want to be still excited that people are reporting feeling better. I think we just want to be cautious that um, because we want them to be happy again, we want them to be well, and sometimes we rush that. And this was a great comment as a reminder to be like, hey, take it slow, let's still keep supporting, let's still keep monitoring, let's still keep being there, um, let's keep having the conversation. Um, because I think we, we want our kids to be okay. So as soon as we see that sign that we're like, okay, good, they're back. We should, we should go slower. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have time for a couple of more questions. Um, someone asks, what if a student refuses to get help? Well, that's a, it's a, it's a common question and it is a challenge, but we do, um, have to remember that we do have an opportunity as long as our children are minors and sometimes um, and it's true you can lead a horse to water but you can't lead them to drink but one of the things that we do find a lot of times with teens they may say i'm not i am not going i am not talking but um when they're put in the situation um they very often will talk and maybe not the first time um so it's not there's not an easy solution to that um, but it, it does require not you, again, it's, it's those conversations. I read a really great book called I'm Not Sick, I Don't Need Help. And it was written by a psychologist who, whose brother was uh, very mentally ill and needed help. And, his, and this guy was a psychologist. He knew the answers, but his brother wouldn't listen to him. And then he realized it was how he was having these conversations. And with a couple of tweaks um, in how he approached his brother, his brother was, you know, realized, I, yeah, I'm going to, he had empowered him and he wanted to get help. So it's not an easy solution, Maureen, you may have some, some better tips, but, um, but it's a challenge and it's, it's something that you, you need to work on and, um, and, and try to work through it. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of it too is therapists are awesome, but um, can be awesome. But sometimes too, I caution parents when they're looking for their child to say, 
Uh, it's kind of like finding that perfect pair of shoes. It has to be the right fit. Um, so sometimes, like if you're thinking about um, connecting them with the therapist because you feel like it's at that point that there are that concerns that it's not necessarily the first person that you call. Um, and I think it's empowering too for young people to feel like they have a voice. Um, the last thing we want to do is any of us, we don't want to feel invisible. We don't want to feel like we're not heard. So sometimes it's um, asking around and, you know, you might take them and the therapist, the first one wasn't a good fit. And, and it's reassuring them to be like, okay, so I hear you. That wasn't a good fit, but let's try something else. Um, and also to um, having conversations, whether it's with your school counselors as well, because um, besides therapy, there's other things that can be very positive that, um, you know, mindfulness and meditation and other things that, what do they enjoy doing? Because that might be the start to then having more conversations. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question here, someone that says, I'm a peer with NAMI in Vancouver, Portland area. How can I reach out to the youth that are coming out to make sure that they are safe and make sure that they are not going to harm themselves? Well, that's really what this whole presentation was about. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I'm a big fan of NAMI and, and all the work that you do. In fact, I just signed up for a, a, a NAMI conference here in New Jersey. Um, so I, it, it is not having these very direct conversations, you know, as a peer to be comfortable. And, and I really encourage you to do a little bit more research on how to have these conversations, how to talk openly, directly about it and safely, right? We talked about the language, make sure you're, you're modeling the right language and, and have these conversations. If you've noticed things, um, if you're a peer, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of movies and, and series and books that talk about suicide. It might be an opportunity to have a conversation that way. So there, there are many opportunities, but you wanna make sure that you're educating yourself and you're having the conversation safely. And the main thing too, um, when I wanted to make sure I'm having no conversations, it's a friend of my organization, but I'm saying someone who wants to be able to be this visible. But what I also do is sometimes I'm saying, I don't have the answers. I don't have the answers. But what I can do is I said, I will see you, I will be your own, 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 Okay, I don't know what happened, Maureen. Something happened with your audio. That was a little difficult to hear, um, but I uh, appreciate it. Um, and uh, it is getting a little bit late, so um, I think we're going to uh, stop here. Um, and uh, again, I want to thank Maureen and Wendy very, very much for your informative presentation. We appreciate it, and we appreciate all of you attending tonight. And I'm going to turn it back over to Kelly, who will uh, wrap things up for the evening. Thank you for joining our webinar on youth suicide, starting the conversation. There is an exit survey which we need everyone attending to fill out. The webinar blog is open now and available for the next seven days on the NJCTS website for any additional questions that were not covered in tonight's presentation. That website is www.njcts.org. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> the, um, our next presentation is Pet Therapy, Support Animals and Mental Health, presented by Trisha Baker 
and is scheduled for October 14th, 2020. This ends tonight's web webinar. Um, thank you, Maureen and Wendy, for your presentation. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night.